you envy the Prime Minister's job at the moment? No, I think she's got a really, really tough job. And I, I you know, always say, even when I'm criticising her policy, that I accept it comes from a, a well-intentioned place. But I think she's going to find that the deal she wants to do now is a deal that one won't pass Europe, but two won't actually pass the views of the British people. And therefore, I think it's going to be very difficult for it to proceed on that basis. You, you've campaigned. You, you think there's, it'd be good to have a second referendum. You've said that uh, loud and clear before. Do you think the chances of that second referendum are higher today than at any point since I think, 2016? Well, I think the, the, the steps to look at it are these. First of all, I don't think there's any Brexit proposition that can command majority in the House of Commons. So I think there will, at a certain point, or may well be, stalemate. If there is stalemate, then I think, in the end, the only way that you can resolve this is not to rerun the last referendum, but in a sense to go back to the British people and say, do you want to go forward on this basis or would you, would you want to stay? Now, I think one other element in that is that Europe itself is looking at the reforms and changes that it needs to make. Immigration was the big driver of this um, Brexit referendum in the UK. I think that Europe itself knows it's got to deal with its immigration issue. The Italian election tells you that, the recent elections in Austria, all over Europe. This is a big question. So I still think it's possible, and I think this is more likely now than it was a few months ago, that you'll get a, a benign coming together of circumstance where there isn't really a Brexit that works, that is going to command a majority. And Europe itself also recognises that there are changes that it needs to make, which are changes very much in line with some of the sentiment that gave rise to Brexit. I'm curious how you would characterise President Trump and Prime Minister May's relationship. President Trump said it was the highest level of special. Do you see it that way? Was it as close as yours with yeah, President look, Bush? You know, I, I mean, I was Prime Minister for 10 years. I had a very close relationship with President Clinton, President Bush. I don't. I hope that they get on really well because it's in the interest of our two countries that they do. And you know, it's not my job to come here and sort of criticize your president or indeed criticize her. I hope the relationship's special because it should be because these are two countries, you know, mm -hmm. United nice country and your country, we got a lot in common. We have a special relationship. <laughs> well, that's levels. Well, okay. Yeah. I won't go into that right now, but, <laughs> so, but <laughs> well, I don't, and I, I don't know what that says about their relationship either, but anyway. <laughs> Talking friendships, purely friendships. Right, anyway. okay, jolly good. Um, going back to the idea of a second referendum very quickly, Tony, Sir John Major said on the Mar show on Sunday that a second vote has democratic downsides, but that it was morally justified. Well, what would you say to the people who were told, first of all, it was a once-in-a-lifetime vote, that voted for Brexit, won the vote, and still want Brexit. Would their democratic rights be bulldozed in the instance of a second referendum? No, I, I don't think you can say they're going to be bulldozed because we're not suggesting anything different happens without their consent. But when you've got large numbers of people who voted for Brexit saying that this deal that the Prime Minister is putting forward, which is kind of half in Europe, half out of Europe, when you get the people who supported Brexit saying, well, that's not what we meant by Brexit, it's very hard to argue that there's a mandate for that because 48% of the country voted to stay and of the 52% that voted to leave, it's clear there is a deep division within that group as to what it really means. And in the end, look, my view is in the end it's a very simple thing. If you're going to leave Europe, okay, leave, but understand short and medium term there's going to be significant economic pain. If you're going to stay, then stay. I think this is, I think, what um, the Prime Minister will find is the problem with her proposal is that it doesn't satisfy the people like me who want to stay and it doesn't really satisfy the people that want to leave. And my final question, uh, Mr Blair, because we're right up against the clock, but in the instance of a no-deal, clean Brexit, does the UK still flourish long-term either way? If we do a, a, a no-deal, sort of absolute rupture with Europe, yes, we can flourish, but we're going to have to do a lot of economic and social restructuring. And my anxiety has always been that the people who want that vision for Britain will pull us out of Europe, but they'll never actually persuade the British people to then do that economic and social restructuring. So if you, if you want that new vision for, you, for Britain, which is very different, implies a very different system in Britain, I think that's another reason why this has got to be voted for by the people to make sure that they're actually prepared to go for that type of future. because. I suspect a lot of the people in the Labour voting constituencies in the north of England 
They might want Brexit, but they certainly don't want that type of deregulated, light tax, low public spending future that some of the Brexiteers want. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.